Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Scott Loney. This is my 18th year at Hawkins School. And I just did some math while you were talking, Chuck. Um, we actually started our conversation about maybe becoming uh, teammates uh, nine years ago, actually. Yeah. Um, so just like everything at Birchwood, it's thoughtful. We, most people don't know we spent almost two years in private, super secret, uh, in undisclosed locations, um, <laughs> having conversations around this. Um, and so half of my career has been getting to know what is a truly amazing community. It's not a school, it's a community where kids learn. And what makes it amazing is that it's a coherent set of values carried across time and never satisfied. The success cycle applies to the way Chuck and Helene have run this school. Always trying to get better, always trying to find ways, always checking and validating what they're doing against research and then practicing it to make sure if the research is we or not, um, it really works with kids. And then inculcating those habits in the educators who serve the children here. Which is why I do think you feel confident that those habits um, will continue forward. As you all know, habits are hard to break, uh, take a long time to make, and are hard to break. Well, the habits of the school are organized around a set of core values um, that I do think raise children of high character. One of our litmus tests and to validate this is as we were thinking about um, having Birchwood and Hawken become one, I went back and talked to every single admission director at Hawken since you were sending kids to the upper school and asked, have you ever seen a, a Birchwood kid that wouldn't fit Hawken? No, not one. Said, well, let's just take them all then if we can. Um, <laughs> seems like a good thing. You're not required to go to the upper school, but we really appreciate it if you do. So, as we got to know this school, what I started to feel was uh, was not a business partnership where you needed some s security around sustainability over time, and we had a West Side school that would connect to our schools. I felt a real kinship with two educators who are purpose driven, and written into the contract when we sell. There's some things that weren't public, but I can relay a few of them around. There, it is in the contract that we will sustain the, the Birchwood model through its forward history, um, and that the Birchwood model will be guided by the written word and deed of uh, these founders, which is not done. Part of being founders and residents will give them the time to continue to write guiding language, and knowing them, they'll then practice it, and if they don't like it, they'll rewrite it, and it'll become part of the model. And Chuck and Elaine are right. Um, I have a five-year contract. They may or may not want me in six years. Theirs are evergreen. They're here as long as they want to be. So how long will the double X be here? I don't know, ask them. Because <laughs> Hawkins happy to have them. But I will say, this school's gotten bigger. Um, they've gotten a little older. Um, and I think their gift into the world right now is to stay connected to this unbelievable gem of the school and help it move forward and help it stay anchored, but not to make sure pick up and drop off is working out quite as well as it always has. I think somebody else can do that. But I think they're right. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, Dr. Ryan Woolley in a minute. Um, they started dating without behind my back. I didn't really know that. Um, uh, but I'm just here to bless the marriage, um, which is probably one of the most fun things I'll get to do all year. So I've been there 18 years. Ryan joined our team right after that. Um, he has been a central member of our leadership team. And while his title has been, you know, chief um, technology officer, he's been involved in pretty much every part of the school and has always been one of my key strategic thinkers, the people who I go to when we're playing with really complicated and big ideas. Um, so what you should know is that I've never met a team that has been created and designed and cared for by a leader that is as well respected, other than here, as Ryan's technology team. They are amazing, which is why 
this is kind of a win, 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 because the team Ryan has built, we're elevating um, two gentlemen under him to fill in for him, and I don't, we're not going to miss a beat. And Ryan built that team very carefully, and each and every one of them will tell you he walks on water. I will tell you, Ryan doesn't do anything without great and deep thought. Um, and I will tell you, I think out loud and iterate in real time. Ryan sits there and listens, and I get a five-page, really thoughtfully uh, constructed response that's way smarter than anything that I put out into the ether when we were trying to figure things out. Um, and <laughs> what's happened with technology under his leadership at Hawken is pretty amazing if you think about where we started. But what's kind of more amazing is if you look at the rationale of why things were done and how they were anchored. They're always anchored around the needs of the children that are learning or the adults who are trying to serve them. Everything Ryan and his team has done has been extraordinarily purposeful um, and collaborative in the school with now four campuses and as many people. Um, we're the largest independent school in the state of Ohio. Um, Every single place that technology touches, which is everywhere, um, Ryan's team is welcomed in the door, and there's something that was done by his team that bettered the experience for everyone. And it was an accident. One of the things I've said about Ryan is he has his fingers in everything and leaves fingerprints on nothing. So, what I can also say is that as brilliant and strategic as he is, he's incredibly modest. Um, and I think humility is one of the core values of this school. Um, and, and I think, you know, when you think about how much respect we have for this place, you know, Ryan, I've had this conversation, the Hippocratic Oath comes in, first do no harm, right? That can't happen with Ryan. He's gonna, he's gonna observe, he's gonna listen, he's gonna watch, but he's gonna question, he's gonna ask Chuck and Lane, well, why do you do this? And have you thought about this? And they're gonna have an answer. When they don't, they'll go, let's try it. So I think there is a chance that this can be just a beautiful evolution of everything that they've built. And they're going to be here to supervise and watch it and bless it. And I think jump into the actual work with children that is not only going to help the school, but uh, fill the joy in them that, that, you know, I think the administrative part of, of running a school is never their goal. Um, it just was something was necessary to do along the way. Uh, I think uh, Ryan is one of the most capable administrators that you're ever going to find anywhere. But if I think of one word that um, comes to mind uh, about Ryan, it's collaborator. Um, Ryan finds a way to add value to every partnership that he enters, and he is capable of seeing um, the possibilities in other people before they see them in themselves, and figure out how to suss them out and. And, and again, leaves no fingerprints. Watching him grow, you know, some of the people on his team and watching him interact with some of the people on our leadership team has been just amazing. Um, he's incredibly patient, he's incredibly considerate, he's reflective, he's extraordinarily cool under pressure. We've had him, whenever we have a really ugly crisis, Ryan is always there quickly and is always a stabilizing force for figuring out what do we do, what, how do we do it, who do we need to talk to. Um, uh, he, he approaches everything with a win-win. How do we turn whatever this is, even if it's not great right now, into kind of a win for everybody? Um, compromise is not a word that Ryan considers to be a dirty word. It's the, it's the way you make things happen in the world that can last. Um, uh, and he, is, he works with people, <coughs> always. Um, there's no hierarchy that moves with him. Um, which I think is what makes him so effective. But he's also a workhorse. Uh, and it's contagious, and that is the habit uh, and the culture of this place. Uh, he also is one of the few people I've known who's taught kindergarten, uh, middle elementary, middle school, high school, and college. Um, and I can tell you that there's a lot of things that drive him. The obvious is he likes being with students. But the other is, he has an insatiable curiosity to learn new stuff. Just, if there's an opportunity to learn something he doesn't know, he's, it's, like, it's like candy for him. So, 
the idea of learning why and how Birchwood does what Birchwood does and figuring out if he can do some of it and how we can watch other people do it and help them is like a whole other menu for you for quite a while. Um, and uh, he's, he is what you would expect. He's a great father um, to Francie and Jonah and Princeton. Uh, his wife Christina is a pretty esteemed educator in her own right. Um, so uh, there's, I know they, they benefit from each other's expertise. Um, but literally, I can't think of anyone better for this moment for this school. And I think, and I, my hope is, that by taking some of the burden of administration off the daily, that we'll actually have you around and engaged and active with the ARC of the school for actually long. Um, uh, I might time out in four years, but uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I got a long way to go. Um, I'm inspired to think about what 40 years leading a school that started with, what was your first year home? 20. 23. Um, 20. 20. 20 students um, uh, to what it is today. Um, so partnerships only work if they start with deep mutual respect. And the fact that they started dating. Um, I found out they started dating at my Christmas party. I walked up with, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, was uh, just a gift. Because um, sustaining this, making sure that it's protected, making sure that it is a place that uh, everybody doesn't have to worry about, this is the best of all possible worlds. Ryan will lead. He will inspire. Um, but he's going to anchor it, even if someday you step away. Um, in everything that is virtual. I have no doubt about that. So, let me introduce Dr. Ron Woolley. I really do not like following those two gentlemen. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm just going to jump right in. And I'm, I'm uh, I'm not as good at uh, just keeping all this in my head, so I did have to write some things down. 1984 was a good year. In pop culture, Prince Purple Rain and Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA were both released. Popular movies included Footloose, Ghostbusters, Beverly Hills Cop, and John Hughes' first movie, Sixteen Candles. Uh, the game show Jeopardy was launched. The game Tetris was launched. In politics and world affairs, Hong, Hong Kong was given back to China. It had been a British colony since 1842. Geraldine Ferraro became the first woman to run on a major party's presidential ticket. In technology, the first solo transatlantic balloon flight uh, happened uh, with an American aviator. Um, the first untethered spacewalk on the Challenger Macintosh PC was launched in the U.S., along with the famous Orwellian 1984 Super Bowl commercial. I bet some of you remember that commercial. In sports, uh, the NBA slam dunk contest was reintroduced, and future Cleveland Cat Larry Nance would win. Um, the longest game in Major League Baseball history happened, lasting over eight hours. And you might remember the Summer Olympics happened in Los Angeles that year. In education, we saw the first TED conference ever. But more importantly, an ambitious and idealistic husband and wife team locked arms with some of their friends to start a new school they would call Birchwood, which they would then shape and improve over the next 40 years. Maybe there was some kind of ripple in the universe, because in addition to working hard on my breakdancing moves that year, <laughs> my 12-year-old self had his first life-changing teacher my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Mazan. And the tiny seeds may have been planted for a future career in education. Mr. Mazan was an engaging teacher for sure, but shaped me and my classmates well beyond the content of academic curriculum. For example, we were required to wear our shirts tucked in, and we were required to wear belts. We had to show utter respect for him and for our classmates always. We had to get our work done on time. It was perhaps the first time in my life that I thought about what kind of person I was and, and what I wanted to be. 
It was the first time I had an awareness of my character. So 45 minutes away, the double acts were building a school with Aristotelian character as one of its cornerstones. For the next 40 years, they would build, shape, and improve, and refine not just their personal practice, but that of the entire school. They read and studied and changed what they were doing. They read and studied and changed what they were doing. Along the way, Birchwood's unique approach took shape, which, along with character education, included concepts like the success cycle, the natural learning model, and generative collaboration. These concepts are uniquely Birchwood, but they rest on a deep base of theory and research. The double acts like to read. <laughs> are there any English majors in here? <laughs> any of you remember reading John Milton's Paradise Lost? So, uh, nerdy English majors like me like to share this legend of, uh, that was passed around that John Milton had read everything that had been published in the world. So think about that for a second. And think about how many pieces of information had been published in the time I've been standing up here <laughs> and how impossible that would be. I don't know if it's true, but that was the legend. He was a voracious reader. Um, and that's pretty amazing considering he eventually became blind. So he had a reader continue to read to him deep into his late adulthood. The devil acts are the John Miltons of education. <laughs> they have read everything, yeah. and as you can see. And they incorporate it into what they do, and they look at what works, and they, um, they weave it into what's happening. Um, and it goes deep. Uh, so they, in, on da in daily practice, they refer to uh, philosophers like John Dewey, um, Jerome Bruner, uh, but then they'll also refer to Paul Kirshner, Carol Dweck, and lots of modern researchers as well. It's all in there. So it's this duality that draws me here. The Devil X and their friends have built a school that stands on a strong foundation but continues to evolve. They don't, they don't chase fads, but they consider the new knowledge driving those fads and incorporate that insight into what is already working. So rather than scrap and start over, which happens all too often in, edu in education. They keep learning and keep adding to and shaping practice. To me, that is the best of all worlds. In addition to the well-informed and, let's face it, successful approach to teaching and learning, they have built a model professional culture. Faculty and staff here are committed at a level that stands out even in a profession of do-gooders. There is pervasive respect and positivity. Everyone is engaged. Everyone is all in. I shared some of these observations with faculty and staff at the end of the summer, but there are some moments that capture what Birchwood is about and why I want to be here. First, there were the warm greetings and welcomes I got when I started coming around. Now as an insider, I can see that those greetings and welcomes happen for everyone and they are authentic. When I attended my first professional development session here, I noticed how engaged the teachers were, how they would feverishly take notes when Chuck and Helene would speak and how they would fully participate in conversations afterward. When I attended my first poetry show and followed some of the prep for History Day, I could see that everybody was involved in the process, not just the English and history teachers, and I saw the tight, positive feedback loops that teachers were giving kids. That's really good, Johnny. Let's try to build on that emotion. There was a moment when I was in the office and a young girl, I'm guessing she was a first grader, came down to the office to claim a prize for leveling up in math. Um, everyone in that office was involved in making that moment big for her. Taking her picture, they let her pick out a prize. You could see the pride on her face and on their faces, and it was just precious. It says a lot that Chuck and Helene have continued to teach, even while running a growing school. And they haven't let the growing list of demands that all school leaders face crowd out the time for important conversations either about what a current student needs or about how we can keep getting better at giving feedback. And as a former member of the Upper School Admissions Committee at Hawken, I can tell you that Birchwood students are often the strongest applicants we get and seem to be universally hardworking, engaged, polite, respectful, and kind. But since I can't come to Birchwood as a student, I guess the next best thing is to work here. It is my honor and privilege to get to work with this amazing faculty and staff 
to be mentored by two of the best educators in the world. I've been inspired every day I've been here. I'm deeply honored to have Chuck and Helene and Scott's trust and faith. Even though I, I've not yet had much to do with our success, I'm so proud of what we do. We really know our students and we are committed to setting in motion the flywheel of their lives. In addition to helping them master academic content, we help them form habits and characteristics that set them up to become productive, happy, and co contributing young adults. For those of us who do this for a living, I can tell you the reward never gets old. What is getting old is all of us in this room, as I've led around. <laughs> so let me bring this to a close. I want you to know that I know why you send your children here. I know how special this place is. We are all lucky the Double X chose to go on this adventure. We know as we look forward the future, uh, as we look toward the future, that the school will evolve like it always has, but its core will remain unchanged. It will always be a place that puts its students at the center. It will always be a place that builds intellect and character in equal measure. It will always be a place that helps students form good habits, setting up with us a strong trunk and a strong root system that will take them into the next stage of their lives and all of the ones that come after that. Will it set them up for good high schools and colleges and jobs? Yes, of course it will. But those benefits are actually byproducts of something more important. That they learn to be alive in the biggest way possible, a way that honors the true, true gift we have of being here on this planet and being together. Thank you. So that didn't stay up long enough, and he, he told us, I don't want that behind me when I'm talking, so you should take a look. <laughs> We're so proud <laughs> of our new head of school. Um, also, just to build on what Scott said about how he's a collaborator, and he'll come in with an idea to help out. He was the one who thought, we should have slides. <laughs> and Helene, like, why don't you do it? <laughs> and uh, it's a good idea. At least having the slides was a good idea. <laughs> All right. I did it. So there's the four of us in 19. No, no, no. That was taken during the merger. But. Those are the ones of us who sat around in our living room um, thinking about this venture and, and planning it. That's our first, uh, the whole school right there. <laughs> 20 students, Linda Brown, Lorraine Sang sitting on the floor. That's just in the hallways that first year. Mm -hmm. Well, we were off and off, off and off on field trips. There's Miss Brown. We were always able to just pile them in a car and go. <laughs> 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 yeah. We thought of the city as a classroom. So we, we went. You know, the museum curator could do better at talking about Egypt uh -huh. than we could out of the textbooks. We just got in the car and went. So that was the very first poetry show. Um, actually, for two years, we did literature shows, like puppet shows at the library, and then we started to do poetry. And the librarian, the children's librarian there, it's the West Park branch of Cleveland Public School, um, was always looking for after school programs. And so I called her once and said, what do you think if we, and she said, oh, we need it, we need it, sure, come. And so we had it there for, I think, 10 years until we got too big for their, for the, their space. So the, the year we did Dr. Seuss was one of the first years, and the 
kids gave me green eggs and ham. <laughs> So this was our, let's see, I have some notes here. So those are the 5th through 8th graders, um, 24 students, but I think we had 62 at that time. That's my first classroom. I taught reading in there, social studies in there, and our library was in there. <laughs> and I feel very affectionate toward that that space. Th things were all laid out for an open house on that picture. So this is the uh, first time we went to National uh, History Day and had a win. Um, a Mary Rose Ocar was the uh, uh, representative in, um, from here in Washington. And um, so these kids won first place, and they did the McGuffey Readers. And I saw one of the judges afterwards, and he said, it was that interview with Edith Hallgood that did it. Mm -hmm. This was a 97-year-old lady who, in 1988, grew up in the McGuffey Readers, and um, she continued to have a McGuffey Society. And our students found that out by going to the Western Reserve Historical Society before the internet, so we had to you know, pile in a car and go there and handle these manuscripts that we couldn't believe they would let human hands touch. So, fast forward. Um, Connie comes along and has had 215 national qualifiers and 66 who placed at the national level. Um, <laughs> my point is to show you the seeds and how it's kept going until today. Um, and I know it's just going to keep going and going and going. So here we are, Joe Perino has joined the group. And seven years, eight years, but he's just keeps taking on the nationals with Connie. And what's interesting about this picture, this is last year, I think, these are Birchwood alums who wanted to keep doing history day in high school. So um, they got somebody at Hawkins to call it a club, and, and they got somebody to back them. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so here's. If you recognize the, the banner that we had up at first, that was our first logo, the three circles and a trunk, inspired, developed, equipped with a strong conscience. Um, that was made out of flannel by our art teacher. Um, but, so there it is. And it was our first, um, with future problem solving, getting to the state pool. And I want to say something about that. Um, so we began to qualify uh, for the state pool on a regular basis. And once in a while, get to future problem solving is an international program. And so you had to win first place at the state to go. And so for a while, that was happening once in a blue moon, but it happened. And now in recent years, it's happened almost every year. Um, and there we go. This was last year. And we have, Lorraine and I have two teachers that are going to carry the torch. And Jen Seward and Diane Owen and also Rebecca Graham's joining them. And this team went to the internationals. Um, also, um, Future Problem Solving has a um, writing component uh, where students write a scenario. And um, Lorraine has had placers, I don't know how many times. Um, what an excellent teacher for helping children to write science fiction stories and do so well um, repeatedly. 
there's our first science fair. <laughs> um, and Ms. Brown, Linda, started it. And we had not found a lot of quality competitions in science at that time. And so we realized we just have to start having our own science fair. And hers wasn't just run-of-the-mill science fair. She added that the children have to do a literature review first. Um, so, and then a whole process of testing hypothesis. And I didn't picture this, pick, pick this one, but the one in the middle of my little daughter. <laughs> She's uh, 38. <laughs> okay, so then um, Young Astronaut Day, I have some facts here to look at. Um, so Linda began to search out quality uh, science competition. This is in 1996, Young Astronaut Day. And the, the girl right next to her is Mrs. Tseng's daughter. <laughs> it's a fun picture. And the boy on the right now works for NASA. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, but uh, so NASA, is, with this program, it, uh, is trying to introduce uh, children with, with STEM ideas um, where they do um, engineering projects, something like that. And uh, yeah. So fast forward, <laughs> this is last year at Young Astronaut Day, and look at the happy faces. <laughs> and now, Linda's joined by uh, Michelle Bodman, uh, Rana Bottini, Lauren Miller, and Sam Miller, um, all the way, you know, from third grade up. And uh, while I'm at it, um, so just, just real short about Linda, you know, you see our awards booklet and what all the things that the children do, but this whole concept that Chuck was talking about, that teachers just keep working at it, working at it, working at it, and she hasn't stopped yet to find these quality competitions and, the, uh, and to get grants. So I wanted, there was one grant um, for equipment and from NASA, I think this was. And they won first and second place at the Satellite Geospatial Technology Conference. <laughs> and this is not, I mean, last year she got some rockets, like rover rockets. <laughs> it's, it's a long list. Um, and now with Michelle, they have top nominees in the World Cup Masters competition, which is the middle school level of the International Society and Engineering Fair run by the Society of Science. Um, I better not go on. I think you get the idea. There's this thing. Sitting and uh, brainstorming with students. Um, who knows about what? because of all the different competitions that they do. Power of the Pen was starting in, in 1992 by Chubb, and they were partners um, all these years. Um, you know, her, maybe they were brainstorming about this scholastic, this national prestigious writing competition where she's won gold, silver, and medal. Um, her children have, have gotten those. Um, but, last year, fast forward, with her co-teacher, Jen Seward, at the Power of Pen competition with that big trophy. They won the sweet stakes last year, um, you know, where they won in various categories. <clears throat> and then we have math. I have to talk about math. <laughs> um, but, you know, putting into place all the various math programs where uh, the children have to learn problem solving and they're really hard problems. And uh, maybe you've heard about them at home, but Continental <laughs> Math League, AMCA, the Noetic, and um, he might be upset with me, but 
in math comms, his teams were first place in Ohio two years in a row, and he was chosen to be the Ohio coach at the Nationals, and on and on. So, some of our graduations. Um, that, Mrs. Waldo. <laughs> That, that was our technology teacher until two years ago. And so there she is, graduating from Berkshire. Uh, this was a graduating class in uh, this was our 10th graduating class. We're growing. This was the graduating class um, in our 30th year. This is last year's. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we have what we call veteran teachers. Um, when teachers come here, it's kind of like quicksand. <laughs> they can't get out. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, these teachers who have been around for decades, um, and, you know, many of them still here. He, uh, he, even his third and fourth graders are distinguished in the, in the noetic competition. Um, and he makes them learn their facts with the uh, wood And then his wife, Rhonda Sproul, um, so she's been here 21 years, and I, Mr. and Mrs. Sproul are really pillars in the first through fourth grade team. And I just wanted to show you this. This is a History Day project. But the student on the left is Mrs. Uetsch. <laughs> 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 and Joe's going to kill me. But <laughs> <laughs> There's Mr. Pino there on the left. <laughs> I think fourth grade, maybe, and the science project <laughs> with Miss Brown. Okay, and then the merger, and um, this was 2016, and of course it was um, a merger that benefited both schools. But what gave me confidence was when I met the people and got to know the people. Um, you know, Mr. Looney and the, the others and the administrative, such good people and trustworthy leaders, leaders and gave us confidence. Um, so, great partner. There's, I don't know if you know about this, yeah, yeah. but there's Mr. D had the, sitting here with his guitar and the whole school of kids sitting on the floor singing songs and the interesting thing is a lot of those songs were also ones we sang 35 years ago so, you know you had to be from the 60s right <laughs> to know Peter Paul and Mary <laughs> these songs but of course they've, we've added to it but um, and we've had we have a school song and just to see children sing is so joyful. And now Mr. Perino plays guitar too, so that that tradition so should continue. Mr. Oh, Mr. Roy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and our new teacher, Benson Anderson, also does. <laughs> Sounds like a hoot nanny, right? <laughs> This is our current faculty. Fifty some people. Fifty one. Okay. Um, and so we've gone from four to fifty one. And this is a team of staff members who believe in our mission and they know how to keep going. 
and they've made it better. And Ryan has 51 partners, and they're lucky to have it. And I just want to add that I feel that way too. Um, I have confidence in Ryan, and I am happy he's here with us. Welcome, Ryan.